Bonjour mes amis et bienvenue au Rest is History avec moi, Dominique Sandbrook et mon ami Tom Hollande. Tom, that was some beautiful French. <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, we are, well, we say it every time, don't we? We're in the middle of our World Cup marathon. I'm actually sick of saying it. We are in the middle of our <laughs> so World Cup marathon. So say something else. We don't know when that, what order they'll be put out in. This it could be at the two. beginning, couldn't it? Yeah. Or it could and be at the end. Up, but who knows? That's the jeopardy. <laughs> it's the World Cup. We're doing a series of podcasts about the history of the competing countries, choosing sort of slightly offbeat subjects sometimes. And we come to France. Now, Tom, a few weeks ago, we did an absolutely, even if I say so myself, an absolutely magnificent podcast about French history through film with the French critic Muriel Zaga. And it was brilliant, not because of anything. It's magnifique. It was magnifique. It was super. It was extra. And that wasn't because of anything you and I contributed at all. It was because she was brilliant. And so if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to that. If you have listened to that, keep listening because Tom is going to... Tom, are you going to do the whole podcast in a French accent or not? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm going to keep it very British because actually um, the subject today does have a British angle and indeed an American yeah. angle. And Ooh. indeed it has a link to uh, the theme of the podcast that you were talking about, which is film. Because uh, today's subject is um, Louis Amy Augustin Le Prince, who mm -hmm. I think can legitimately be described as the father of cine film, of moving film moving camera Ooh, nice uh and it's a very interesting and ultimately rather tragic and mysterious story that's how we like him uh, have, have you ever heard of uh, louis le prince i'll be honest with you the only time i've ever heard of him is when you told me you were going to do a podcast <laughs> okay okay so and, and i deliberately not informed myself tom so that i can have the pleasure yeah of, of learning at the feet of the master okay so louis le prince he's born in 1841 in metz Uh, and Metz is, you know, it's it's on the um, the eastern flank of France, uh, and yeah. and so it's not surprised perhaps that um, Louis Le Prince's father is in the artillery. So it's a, a kind of military station. Uh, he's a major, but I think more significantly for our story, Dominic, um, he is a friend of Louis Daguerre, as in the, the inventor of the daguerreotype. And in fact, um, taker of the uh, the first ever photograph of a person. Because the exposure, when Daguerre was taking his photographs, it had to last for several minutes. So, mm -hmm. you know, traffic's going too fast for that. But he takes a photograph in 1838 of a street in Paris where there is a man having his boots blacked. So there's oh. the man himself and the boot black. And these right. are the two first people ever to be photographed. So um, for, for young Louis, very exciting to be um, in association with Louis Daguerre. Yeah. And Daguerre teaches Le Prince chemistry and photography. And that's a reflection of the fact that uh, Le Prince, unlike you, Dominic, he's interested, very interested in the arts, but he's also interested in science. And it's yeah, this, that is a difference. So he, he has a very, very artistic temperament, but he also has a very, very keen interest in, uh, in science and the practical applications of science. I only have one of those things, Tom. I, I have know the artistic you do. temperament. I know. I know. So that is why the likelihood of you making a radical invention in the field of cinematography is limited, I would say. Yeah, unlikely. Louis goes on to study uh, painting in Paris, and then he goes to Leipzig as a postgraduate where he studies chemistry. And while he's at Leipzig, he meets up with uh, an Englishman called John Robin Whitley. And Whitley is the, he's the eldest son of uh, a guy in Leeds who owns an iron foundry, um, and he's called Joseph Whitley. So this, uh, Le Prince's new friend, John Robin Whitley, he's, he's, a, this, you know, he's a, a product of the Industrial Revolution in Victorian Britain. Um, yeah. And they get on tremendously well. Le Prince, I think, is, he seems to be a, a very lovable figure. Uh, he's a, a large kind of um, bear of a man, very gentle, so a kind of gentle giant, much admired for his brilliance and, and for his kindness. So a very nice man. Sounds great. I would say, uh, of all the people, perhaps, that we've discussed on our podcast, he seems to be the nicest so far. That is a big claim, Tom. That is a big claim, but I, I can't think of anyone who's nicer. In the episode on the Costa Rican Civil War, you have two characters, Don Pepe and Dr. Valverde. I think he's nicer than both of them. Crikey, that, that is, I never thought I'd hear those words. Anyway, so it will not surprise you, bearing in mind how nice Louis Le Prince is, 
that um, John Robin Whitley, the son of a, a, a Leeds industrialist, invites him to, to get, come to Leeds and to visit him. And so Le Prince goes in 1867 and he joins Joseph Whitley's firm. And two years later, Dominic, in 1869, yep. he marries Whitley's sister, Elizabeth who like Le Prince, actually very like him. He's, it, she's um, a, a very talented artist and she's very interested in photography. So again, there's that, that kind of fusion that you, no <laughs> offense, completely lack. <laughs> that, that fusion of artistic brilliance and fascination with technology. I could not have married that woman. Tom. <laughs> you could have done. Oh, fair to say. You could have done, but, but it wouldn't have been as much of a marriage of equals as was the case with um, with Louis and Elizabeth. And they get on tremendously well. They set up a school of applied arts in Leeds. It's incredibly successful. Their particular gimmick is that they take photographs and they fix it onto uh, kind of metal and pots and pans and all kinds of things. They fix photographs to pots and pans? Yeah. So you, you kind of project it onto the pots and pans. Okay. Well. So photographic images onto metal. That's, yeah. their, that's their gimmick. Um, but they also specialize in portraits. So they take, uh, they take a portrait of Gladstone, for instance, oh, and nice. they take a portrait of Queen Victoria. Golly. And the, the measure of, uh, of their renown is that um, in 1878, when Cleopatra's Needle gets set up on the bank of the Thames, so Cleopatra's Needle is an obelisk that's been brought from Egypt. It's still there to this day, mm. reputedly cursed. Um, before they set it up, they put a time capsule underneath, you know, in the foundations where it's going to be erected. And there is, uh, there are, there's a rupee is put there, a railway guide, a copy of Whitaker's Almanac, a baby's yeah. bottle, various other things, um, photographs of England's 12 greatest beauties and Crikey. a photograph taken by Louis and Sarah of Queen Victoria. And it goes in there. Hmm. So I do like a time capsule, Tom. They've gone out of fashion now, haven't they? But uh, they have. But they're great things. Yeah, and and Louis and Sarah are very much a part of it. This exciting time capsule world. <laughs> yeah. So it's all going well, uh, and then, but Louis is clearly a man of uh, of well of international ambition. So having conquered Britain in 1881, he decides that he's going to go off and conquer America. So he goes uh, with his wife and his family, and they set off. And while he's out there, he serves as an agent for a company that's making that, you know, that very kind of deeply embossed wallpaper that people loved in the late Victorian period. Yeah. So dense and textured and yes. very heavy wallpaper. Yeah. Yes. And uh, he also becomes the agent for a group of um, uh, French photographers who are out there. So he's very much kind of, you know, keeping up with his photographic interests. And these are guys who are specializing in kind of panoramas of you know spectacular american vistas uh, yeah. and also particularly of battlefield scenes so battle of gettysburg that we right, did. Yeah. not that long after the yeah. civil war yeah so so that um and he become he he you know he's he's flogging his wallpaper keeping in with photographers and then he gets to palo alto uh by stanford in california and there he sees photographs by a man called Edward Muybridge. Have you heard of him? Oh, yeah. The very famous. So the pioneer of photography and horses. He was all yes. about horses, Muybridge, yes. wasn't he? He was originally called Edward Muggeridge. Yeah. And he changed it to Muybridge because he thought that that sounded more antique. And he changed his name, Edward, to the Anglo-Saxon spelling. Yes, he did. Yeah. So it says e Edward. He had weird. Yeah. Yeah. And didn't he murder somebody? He shot his, he shot his wife's lover. Right. And got acquitted because they said, basically said, fair enough. <laughs> right. So he's an interesting man. Yeah. Um, yes, exactly. So he takes these photographs and it's kind of like um, staccato. So you could, you put them together and you get the sense of a horse galloping or, you know, a man running or whatever. Yeah. And Le Prince is obsessed by this. He becomes fascinated by it. And he starts to experiment with a camera that can shoot moving pictures. So rather than kind of take them individually, we'll shoot them and, and uh, essentially create what we would call film, I guess. So taking multiple frames in quick succession. Yeah. So he, he patents this camera, but we don't know if he ever managed to project the, the film that he'd taken. And even if he had, it probably wouldn't have worked because for reasons that I don't quite understand, the camera is taking it at different angles. So oh. you wouldn't get the sense of a kind of continuous running film. It would be coming at you from different angles. It would look quite odd, I think. But definite sense that he's, he's you know, he's onto something. Uh, he's on the right track here. And so he realizes that um, actually the best place to develop this isn't America, but his father-in-law's um, factory back in Leeds. 
And so he goes back to England. He leaves his, his wife and children in America. He takes his eldest son, who by this point is a very able young boy called Adolf. Oh, that's unfortunate. No, Adolf. Oh, Adolf. Adolf. You said Adolf. Well, because he's from Metz, isn't he, originally? So there's, you know. There's... All right. I, or maybe you're pronouncing it in a West Yorkshire way. <laughs> hey, Adolf. 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 <laughs> Okay. He's, I, I don't know what Adolf look, Adolf looked like, but I imagine that he looked he wore a sailor suit. Almost certainly. But but surely not when Adolf. he was in Yorkshire. Papa, papa. Surely then he wore clogs. May I help you? And a flat cap. Hey up. Come on, Adolf. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so uh, Louis and Adolf and <laughs> and um Joseph Whitley. Yeah. They're all piling in. Please do the whole thing in the rest in that accent. Do the rest of it in that accent. They're making camera, and yeah. uh, Joseph Whitley's doing metal work. Actually, don't, don't, don't. All right, okay. <laughs> and Le Prince is working and working on his invention, refining it, making it better and better and better. And by 1887, Dominic, yeah, he is starting to shoot film. Appleers have invented cinema. Aye. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> I think that at this point we should take a break. Yeah, and maybe we should, in the break, we should do all our accents and then come back and do it <laughs> properly in the second half, so we don't offend and horrify listeners. Uh, we will return. <laughs> we will return accent-free with Adolf. More adventures of Adolf after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to the rest is history. Um, now, pleasingly accent-free, at least I'm accent-free. Tom, are you accent-free? We, oui. Very good. Continue, please, with the story of Louis Le Prince, inventor of cinema. Okay, so we are in August 1887, and Le Prince sends footage to his wife in New York, which is 16 frames of a man walking around a corner. Now... <laughs> <laughs> you may laugh, Sounds Dominic. Brilliant. You may laugh, yeah, but this is—I is, I mean, you know, this is where it all begins. One minute you're doing that, the next it's Peter Jackson and the Return of the King. Exactly. However, the the problem for Louis is that he he doesn't know whether it's worked or not. Oh, because he doesn't have a projector, so he's shot it on the camera, but he has, doesn't have a projector. Right. What? There's no projector to be found in all of England. He hasn't invented it yet. Oh, he invents the projector. Well, Crikey. he's he's got his camera. He's shooting this film. Yeah, but he doesn't know whether it works because he doesn't have a projector. Okay, right. So it's unknown, but he's confident enough that he is on the right track. That he applies for a U.S. patent. Right, and he is given this patent on uh, on January the tenth, eighteen eighty eight. Uh, it is patent number three hundred seventy six thousand two hundred forty seven. Uh, and it is the method of and apparatus for producing animated pictures. So there it is. It's commercially registered, set up, ready to go. If he can get it to a sufficient state that you know he can start making money out of it, yeah. and to do that, obviously he has to demonstrate that it works. By October of that year, so 1888, he is shooting film at a rate of about 12 to 16 pictures per minute. So he's he's upped the rate. Yeah, and. That October, he starts to take sequences of film that are incredibly, incredibly moving. You can see them. You go on, on YouTube or whatever and look them up. So the first one, he goes to uh, Oakwood Grange in Round Hay, which is an area in Leeds. And Oakwood Grange is the house of his parents-in-law. So that's Joseph and Sarah Whitley. <laughs> right. So yeah. he goes there. And God, he didn't invent sound, Tom. And they go out into the garden. And yeah. um, there he films, he just films a little scene. Oh. So you see Sarah, his mother-in-law, is, is kind of, she's dancing backwards. Um, and she turns around. And then you see Joseph, and he's there, and his coattails are flying as he turns around. And, you know, it's kind of incredible. This is where, this is where it's beginning. Adolf is there as well. And a friend of uh, Le Prince is called Annie Hartley. So they're all there. And this is where it all begins. He also films uh, Adolf playing his accordion. Papa, papa, oh. listen to me play my accordion. So that's right. that's yeah. going on. And then he he films uh, traffic crossing uh, a bridge in Leeds. So all of this is taken. Now, what is unclear is whether he has developed a projector that is sufficient to display this. And a lot kind of hangs on this because um, we're reaching the climax of the story and there's a mystery around what happens to Le Prince that is, I th suspect, very strongly connected to the fact of whether he had developed the projector or not. So over um, 1889 to 90, 
he's working with a mechanic in uh, in Leeds called James Longley, and they're they're working on what they call deliverers, what we would call projectors. Right. Louis Le Prince seems to have reached a, a kind of a. He's 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 either decided that it is going to work or it's not going to work. Well, that's narrowed it down. I, I know it has. <laughs> Evidence for the fact that he thinks it is going to work. In 1889, he takes uh, American citizenship to go with his French citizenship. Because he wants to establish himself in America. He wants to go and establish himself in America. Late 1890, he's planning to sail to America and, and join his wife there. Yeah. But before he does that, he goes back to France to see his brother. So he he goes to Paris. Um, he goes to Dijon, which is where his brother is. On the 16th of September, he's due to take a train back to Paris where he's going to be met by three of his friends. He misses that train. His brother says that he then helped Louis onto the next train. Right. The train went off and Louis is never seen again. (gasps) He's never seen again. He vanishes completely. Crikey. And body never found? Well, there is a police search. They find no trace of him whatsoever. And there are no leads at all to follow. He, it's as though he's vanished off the face of the earth. And so the, the question then obviously is, well, what happened to him? And there are various theories. And the most popular theory, which was pushed by uh, Louis Le Prince's wife, is that Louis Le Prince had got his projector going. He'd got his film. He'd got his patent. He'd got his American citizenship. He was coming back to America and he was going to um, premiere his, his invention and his work in New York. And this would establish him clearly as the father of Cinefilm. The person who does establish himself as the father of the moving camera is Thomas Edison, who was a notoriously horrible man, uh, in- incredibly jealous of his own work, yeah. uh, ever ready to get rid of competitors. And Edison um, demonstrates that cinematography works the year after Le Prince dies or vanishes or whatever happens to him. So he does that in May 1891. And the theory is, is that perhaps Edison or people working with Edison wanted to nobble the prance. Who knows what happened? Maybe they got rid of him. But would Edison's reach extend to the trains between, where was it, Paris and, and Dijon? Dijon? Yeah. Well, uh, so in 1898, um, Edison sues an American company And he does so on the basis that he is the sole inventor of cinematography, that no one else has developed it. And the American company that's being sued call Adolf uh, as a witness for for defense, for their defense. And Adolf says, yes, you know, he he insists that his father had invented it. Edison wins. And although that verdict is subsequently overturned, it's enough to establish him absolutely clearly as the father of cinematography. And Le Prince's widow is incredibly bitter about it. And basically says, uh, you know, she very, very strongly implies that Edison was responsible for her husband's disappearance. So we don't know. I mean, I agree. It's, I don't think it's very likely. Other theories. Yeah. That he was murdered by his brother, you know. Who he'd come to visit. Who he'd come to visit. Well, I mean, so, so in cases of murder, people, the police invariably look at family members, don't they? They do. And uh, the brother was the last person to see him alive, supposedly. So perhaps didn't put him on the train at all. He's the only person who vouches for the fact he put him on the train. So, yeah. So so that's a possibility. So why would his brother kill him? Perhaps there was, I don't know, there was some will or something like that. Nobody's ever been able to find, uh, you know, a motive that would explain that. But, you know, I guess, again, that's possible. Another theory... Uh, is that uh, Louis Le Prince was gay uh, and that he negotiated um, a, a kind of a, a divorce uh, and he agreed that he would vanish to to spare the family the shame of having a, a homosexual father or husband. Seems unlikely that he would have abandoned his cinematographical interests. Tom. That is definitely an argument against it. And the other argument is that there is absolutely no right. evidence whatsoever that he was gay. So it's just completely invented. It's completely invented. The fourth suggestion is that he commits suicide. And really, for that to make sense, he has to feel that his business isn't going to work. Yeah. He has to probably have felt that he hadn't developed the film, that it hadn't worked. He, he couldn't get his projector. Perhaps he went to see his brother to borrow money, to raise capital, to, to develop it a little bit further. And sustaining that argument is the fact that in 2003, a photo was found in the Paris archives of a man who had been pulled from the Seine in 1890, who looks quite like Le Prince. 
People have argued that the the man in the photograph is too short. He's not. Mm. Le Prince was a very, as said is a very large man that doesn't seem to correspond to that. So again, the the the, the jury is out on that. But we don't know. You know, it's still unproven. Um, we don't know what happened to Le Prince. And the tragedy of the story is, is that because he he dies having invented this film, but it never gets shown. And it may well be that Le Prince died not knowing or thinking that he hadn't been able to develop it. He'd never seen his own films. Well, we don't know. There are people who say that he did, that they developed a projector in Leeds and he showed it to some of his family. But but this is contested. But it's possible, I would say likely, that he didn't. Yeah. And it may well be that he died thinking that he'd been a failure. Oh. And it was only kind of several decades later that finally they were able to, to, to put this film into a projector and show that he had, you know, he had done it. Yeah. He had got there. And so that film of um, his father-in-law and mother-in-law and friend and son in the garden in Leeds and his son playing the accordion and the traffic going over the bridge in Leeds, these are monuments to the history of film, but they're also monuments to the, you know, the, the kind of the ghostly legacy of this extraordinary man who, who really should be better known than he is. So with such an amazing story, why is he not better known? Because he dies and because his, his film is, is only seen much, much later, he's written out of the early drafts of the story of film. And so Edison takes the starring role. Yeah, the, the early drafts, they sort of fall into two categories, don't they? They're either American or they're French. So they're either Edison and then the development of Hollywood or they're Georges Méliès and then the tradition of French cinema, I suppose. Um, but he doesn't quite fit, I suppose, because he's moving between Britain, France, and Britain and America. What an interesting story. It is an interesting story, isn't it? Those clips I've just looked, actually, they're, they are on YouTube, Tom. I mean, they're very short, aren't they? They're, they're short, but they are ghostly, as you say. Yeah. They, it does seem like you're looking at kind of ghosts. Yes. And in a sense, you're looking at the ghosts of Le Prince's career and, and fame. Yeah. Very moving, I think. Tom, I think you should, uh, you're a great campaigner. You should, you should start a new campaign <laughs> for um, recognition in Leeds. He's commemorated in Leeds. There's, I think there's a plaque. Right. Um, so the, the garden where, where the first film was shot uh, got demolished, but I think there's a plaque on the spot uh, commemorating it. Um, Le Prince is remembered in Leeds. Okay. And there was a, I think there was a film was made about him a few years ago. So he is remembered. But I think, you know, this, this series is all about resurrecting people who perhaps wouldn't have their own podcast um, under normal <laughs> circumstances. So I commend Louis Le Prince. To you, Dominic, and to the listeners. Uh, Tom, you've persuaded me. Um, I think a, some sort of biopic with him and Edison as the villain. Yes. Edison played by, who would play Edison, Tom? Oh, uh, that, that cannibal guy. Hannibal. The, the guy who got cancelled for being a cannibal. Oh, my word. Army Hammer. Army Hammer. Army Hammer is Thomas Edison. You're offering him a way back. Yes. And who's playing uh, Louis <laughs> Le Prince? Louis Le Prince. Uh, I don't so, know. Someone who can do both Yorkshire and French. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sean Bean. <laughs> Brilliant. Perfect. Well, because Sean, Sean Bean always dies. Sean he? Bean, yeah, he yeah. does always die. <laughs> Sean Bean would do it superbly. Uh, he's had a lot of interactions with the French in Sharp, so he can draw on that. <laughs> draw, <laughs> yes. draw on that when he does yes. his accent. Uh, brilliant. Uh, so that you can file that alongside the Blind Beak, our um, great unmade <laughs> Netflix series, among the many moving pictures that we ought to have made, Tom. Oh, and we may yet, when we diversify. Out of the podcast business. Exactly. Right. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, merci à, à toi, Tom, for that fantastic story. I do too. And uh, we shall see you all next time. Bye-bye. Au revoir.